ಓಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣುರಮರ್ದನ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಸೊ ಇನ್ ದ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಎಟ್ ಅ ಕ್ರೂಷಲ್ ಜಂಕ್ಚರ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ದ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ಫ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಟುಡೇ ಬೈ ದ ವಿ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಕೀರ್ತಿ ಪ್ರಧಾನಂದ ಜಿ ಹಿ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಮಂಕ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಆರ್ಡರ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ವಿಸಿಟಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ಹ್ಯೂಸ್ಟನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಗ್ರೇಟರ್ ಹ್ಯೂಸ್ಟನ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಯೋಗ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ವೆಲ್ ನೋನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿಲವೆಡ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಭಗವದ್ ಗೀತಾ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಯೋಗ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದ ಯೋಗ ಆಫ್ ಲವ್ ದ ಯೋಗ ಆಫ್ ಡಿವೋಷನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಶಾರ್ಟ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಸೊ ಆಫನ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಚಾಂಟ್ ಇಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ದೋಸ್ ಹೂ ಯು ನೋ ದ ಮೆಮೊರೈಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಫ್ ನಥಿಂಗ್ ಎಲ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ದೇ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಮೆಮೊರೈಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವುಡ್ ಆಫನ್ ಬಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಯೋಗ ಐ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ the monastery where i joined the order where i became a monk so the swami in charge would uh, um uh, encourage us to memorize the bhagavad gita and we would be allotted different chapters and we would be asked to memorize one verse every day not more not less and uh, for many of the novices he would uh, you know uh, he would uh, recommend that they start with the 12th chapter with this chapter not for me though for some reason he uh, he advised me to start with the 6th chapter which is the chapter on meditation we selected different chapters for different people if you have an empty chair near you raise your hand because yeah so there are lots of empty chairs <laughs> yeah all right so yes chanting it uh, memorizing it uh, studying it the 12th chapter is is a favorite chapter for many people and so we're going to start it now we ended with an important verse the f- last verse of the 11th chapter which last time we saw it's an important verse there krishna advises arjuna to be a devotee he says be my devotee mat bhakta that that verse goes like this mat karma krit mat paramo mat bhakta sanga varjita nirvaira sarva bhuteshu yasa mamiti pandava says o arjuna be thou a devotee a lover of god and then he surrounds it with four things to be done if you want to love god four things to be done to be kept track of one he says mat karma krit work for god so the work that you do do something for god to begin with and then do everything for god it could be religious activity it could actually be even our so called secular activity eventually everything can be done for god so that's one whom are you working for don't tell your boss because your boss thinks that you're working for him so but internally you should know that i'm working for god i'm working for god and then he says mat paramo uh, keep y- me keep god as your highest goal keep god as your goal first of all and keep god as your highest goal the greatest goal the whole point of our existence why am i alive why am i living it is in the hope of god realization this is the great project the great adventure of human life of my life I often said you don't have to say it to anybody else but own it up to yourself that uh, um, god realization is my goal so that's one meaning of mat parama keeping me god as your highest goal but also another meaning of mat parama is the support who is your support in life what is your by support i mean what do you depend on what do you turn to in trouble what what are you confident what gives you confidence and uh, and courage in life is it your bank balance your money uh, is it your degrees uh, is it your uh, um, number of friends on facebook 
uh, what is it that gives you confidence in life? What, what is it that you know you can fall back upon it? Are those people in your family? Uh, is it your community? What can, what can you fall back upon? Says, always fall back upon God. Let God be your ultimate support, the real support in life. And if, and whenever you are in trouble, whenever you are in, or whenever you are troubled, in need, turn instinctively, automatically, with all confidence to God. So mat parama, and then two more things. He says sangavarjita nirvaira. Have nirvaira means without any enemy. Have nothing against anybody. Not easy. Because we collect, with assiduously we collect grudges. It's like we're collectors, specializers. Uh, so uh, don't do that. Uh, let go. Mentally forgive. Let go. I've given this uh, uh, story earlier. Uh, I've told you about this earlier also. There's this monk, Swamiji will know, who was the head of our uh, monastery kitchen, in our main monastery. And it's a really tough job, one of the toughest jobs in any of our monasteries, where you feed hundreds of people three times a day, without fail, and on special days, 30, 40, 50,000 people. And all you get is, if nobody complains, then you've done your job perfectly. Otherwise, somebody else will have something. Food is somewhere, everybody gets to grumble. And then you have all these people who are working for you, very difficult. Um, now, that monk, I never saw him... He was grave, but I never saw him lose his temper. And I had asked him, uh, how do you manage not to be angry, irritated, upset, ever? And he did this. You know? <laughs> and he told me the story that uh, when he was a monastic novice many, many years ago in the ashram, one day he was upset about something somebody had said to him. And a senior monk noticed it and asked him, why the long face? And then he said, you know, this monk said this to me, I am upset. And that monk showed him this. And what is that? Brush it off every day. Whatever dirt has accumulated, brush it off before you go to bed. End the day with a clean slate. That also reminds me of a monk who, uh, not of our order, who actually lives under a tree. I don't know if he's still alive, but he had a formula which he called zero zero in English. He called it zero zero. He began his day with no possessions, ended his day with no possessions. Literally. He would wear only a loincloth and he didn't even have bedding. He lived under a uh, tree and he slept under it. I think he had a hut for rainy, whatever. Um, and people bought him things all day long. Villagers would accumulate around him, would gather around him, listen to his talks, or just sit and do bhajan, you know, sing around him. People would bring food and uh, sweets and uh, clothes and stuff like that. And he had a whole nice, well-oiled machinery of, of volunteers running around team who would quickly go out and distribute the things. And the, the commandment was that the end, by sunset, everything should be gone. Should be nothing left over for him. Zero, zero. So learn to brush off, not only physically, but psychologically. Nirvaira, I have nothing against anybody. I also quoted last time from the, from the Bible. Where the Lord says, if you have got something, if you are coming to offer something to me, to me and you have got something against your brother, you hold something against your brother, then leave your offering there, go and settle it with your brother. Then come back and offer, because otherwise I will not take. So, have no enemy, at least in your heart. You may be stern with people. If you aren't, you will get into trouble. So you have to be stern with people, but in your heart have no hatred for anybody at all. At the same time, Sangha Varjita, no attachment to anybody also. So these are difficult things, but he says these are the things which are necessary for you to be, to truly love God. To truly love God, on one side, work for me alone. All that you do in life, let that effort be. Something in your heart, you know it's a worship of God, it's taking me towards God, God word. Second, consider me your highest goal, your purpose in life, your meaning in life, your love in life. And also consider me your support in life. Because actually this is the truth. God is the only support that we have in life. We just don't know it. And then on the other hand, no enmity towards anybody. No anger, no issues, no grudges. 
and uh, also uh, no attachments no stickiness with a person with a place with a thing your only stickiness is with god you stick to god not with the person or the place or the thing or the job or anything like that all right what will happen if you are a devotee of god like this some amiti pandava he says oh pandava oh arjuna such a one will attain to me will come to me and we saw last time what attainment means if you remember drashtum gyatum ha huh? what what was it said and tatve na praveshtum cha you will be able to mystically have mystical experience of god you will be able to realize i am one with god you will be able to attain to god become become one with him um, so or if you are a devotee live in the presence of god in heaven in vaikuntha or kailash or whatever heaven so this you will attain to god now this is the seed of the 12th chapter the 12th chapter is uh, the chapter on bhakti and the last and final chapter the culmination of the central section of the bhagavad gita if you remember the architecture of the bhagavad gita one way of looking at the bhagavad gita is 18 chapters divided into three sections of six chapters each and all of it culminating in the mahavakya that thou art tatvamasi you are that so one way of looking at it is that the first six chapters are talking about who are you ourselves our reality chapter 1 to 6 chapter 7 to 12 is talking about what is that that means god and chapters 13 to 18 are, to, are going to teach us about the identity again a very broad picture big picture because in all of these sections there are many many other things also but the central section is a teaching about god ishwara bhagavan saguna brahman many many words are there the teaching about god and in that chapter in this section of six chapters 12th chapter is the final chapter and so it's the culmination of what's gone on before now the chapter begins in a very interesting way because arjuna asks a question he says this is wonderful what you just told me and he had this amazing mind blowing experience just before that seeing the cosmic form of god i mentioned how oppenheimer recited uh, the verse from that 11th chapter upon seeing the the trinity atom bomb explosion first atom bomb explosion so on so a mind blowing experience of the vision of god um then arjuna asks this question i'm conv- i'm convinced god exists god is real god permeates this entire universe everything is saturated with divinity and indeed you are that god you o krishna you are an incarnation of god all of this is very clear to me and devotion is the path that's very clear to me but now i have a question the question is what about this other thing that you were teaching me earlier the first six chapters i'm not the body not the mind i'm pure consciousness the path of knowledge realization gyana marga the path of knowledge so now there seems to me two approaches to spirituality two approaches to spirituality one approach is the self inquiry approach which you taught me in the first six chapters i am not the body i am not the mind i am the witness consciousness shankara acharya sings mano buddhi hankara chittani naham i am not the mind not the ego not the memory not the intellect then who am i what am i chidananda roopa shivoham i am of the nature of consciousness and bliss i am shiva i am shiva and when we realize this not just sing it actually realize it your problems are solved you have attained to fulfillment you have attained become enlightened so that's a path you taught me that now you are teaching me something else and praising it and saying that this is uh, better this is uh, this is an amazing path that there exists god believe in god worship god Uh, consider god to be your final goal and your greatest support do everything that you are doing for god you do it for god um, do not hold be, have anybody as your enemy do not be attached to anything except god so this is called the path of knowledge now which one which of these is better so arjuna asked this question which of these is better you might say it's a natural question but it creates a problem for those who are on the path of knowledge those in advaita vedanta it creates a problem why the problem is this 
that in Advaita Vedanta, we are not against the path of devotion. In fact, we support it, and, uh, but we always sort of support it in a patronizing way. Somebody said last time, well, is it like a training wheel, little kids, you know? So they are not ready yet for enlightenment. You give them a training wheel, like a tricycle or something, for <laughs> before they learn how to ride the bicycle. So is God like a crutch you use until you begin to realize the reality lies within you and you realize that you are that? Is it like that? So often Advaitins, they, um, they accept the path of devotion, but it is dualistic. It's devotional. And that way it is all right. It is, uh, there's a stamp of approval from the non-dualist. That's one approach. Now, what is the problem? Arjuna's question is creating a problem. Because Arjuna seems to be asking in terms of an alternative. So like two paths. By devotion to God or by self-enquiry, self-knowledge. Which one? But if you ask this question, it creates a problem. As a non-dualist, I will say, no, 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 this question itself is wrong. Because there's no two paths. There's only one path. You have to realize who you are. You have to realize you are Brahman. And on the way, if you want to make a pit stop and do some devotion to God, oh, okay, we have no objections. But you can't stop there. Now, that's base camp. The peak, you have to climb the peak of the mountain. The peak of the mountain is us. <laughs> Non-duality. Not only that, it becomes worse. What becomes worse? Krishna's answer is devastating. <coughs> Krishna should have, should have set Arjuna right. He should have said, no, 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 this is not the way you should think about it. You should think about it as the path of knowledge is what I meant. And what I have taught you in the last six chapters is a big, big help to that. He should have said that. Not only does he not say it, he accepts Arjuna's question as valid and says the path of devotion is better. And we will go like, you're spoiling it all Krishna. <laughs> you're making a big mess of the, <laughs> everything. Uh, so this is, um, so how does the non-dualist deal with it? What the non-dualist does is, some non-dualists say that um, they deal with it in different ways. One is, some non-dualists will say this, that the question Arjuna is asking, if you look at it literally, he's asking who, um, who is a better knower of yoga? Yoga here is the path to enlightenment, different paths to enlightenment. So wh who is the better knower of yoga? Who knows uh, whose yoga is better? The devotee, the one who worships God with form, God with qualities, you know, what you just described, as you have described now, or the one who worships the um, unmanifest, imperishable Brahman. The word he uses is worships. And this gives an exit, if you follow it, this gives an exit door for the non-dualist. The non-dualist will say, ah, see, he is not at all talking about the path of knowledge and the path of devotion. He is talking entirely about the path of devotion, but two options in the path of devotion. So he is at base camp, but he wants to know whether to pitch his tent this year or there. He is not at all talking about us. So we are safe. <laughs> what are the two things he is talking about? One is the path, devotion to the personal God or devotion to the um, uh, attributeless Brahman. So there is a, something in Vedanta called Nirguna Upasana. Worship of the attributeless Brahman. That might seem like a uh, contradiction in terms, but it's there. It's a practice. Until one, en one is enlightened, one realizes I am that. A helpful practice is a kind of meditation on the uh, attributeless absolute. Very difficult, very abstract. So between these two, which, which one should I worship? He's asking. Arjuna is asking. So who says that? The non-dualist who is trying to wriggle out of a tight spot. Other, uh, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, uh, other, uh, we'll, we'll just finish a couple of verses, then I'll take the questions. Don't forget your question. Other non-dualists are much more straightforward. Madhusudan Saraswati, for example, he says the question is straight away about Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Yoga. He says that these are two paths. One is the path of devotion to God, um, like has been uh, what has been taught till now. Other is the classic Jnana Yoga. Madhusudan Saraswati, who is a great non-dualist himself, he says, through Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, you realize I am Brahman. Hmm? 
he gives a very nice very nice summary in, in his commentary uh, on this verse madhusudan saraswati gives a very nice two paragraphs summary of the entire path of non duality and you realize i am brahman of these two which is better which is a better path better better yoga that's what arjuna is asking so he is straightforward there but if they, these are two different paths then ultimately what happens about only through knowledge that's also possible the only through knowledge um, dictum is also protected because one can always say and we do say non dualists will say you can have you can have entire devotion to god and ultimately by the grace of god you will get that non dual knowledge <laughs> all a non dualist insists on is by non dual knowledge by realization that i am brahman by that knowledge you will be free that's all the non dualist insists on and that knowledge you will get by the grace of god why why cannot god give you that knowledge in fact sri ramakrishna at some uh, one point he says ved vedante kiya che ma mai dekhi diye chen my mother has shown me whatever there is in the vedas and vedanta so by the grace of god in fact in all the traditional uh, monasteries shankarite monasteries you will find a worship of the divine mother in shringeri you will find the worship of sharada by the grace of the divine mother we get that very non dual knowledge which we want that also you get by the grace of the divine mother by the grace of god and the avadhuta gita starts with ishvara anugraha deva pumsa madvaita vasana even the desire for non dual realization it comes as a special grace of god so the, there is no contradiction uh, you uh, can fully say that this is uh, arjuna is asking a valid question path of love or path of knowledge which one is better and we on the path of knowledge we are not afraid of this question even when krishna will say path of love is better we'll say yes path of love is much easier and by the end of that path of love you will get the knowledge anyway that's all we want uh, we insist on that sri ramakrishna had a mystic vision in kashi or banaras the spiritual holy city of the hindus so one uh, uh, belief we have is that if you die in that city you will get moksha liberation in this very life if you die in that city what about spirituality meditation devotion knowledge vedanta classes no if you have done it go well and good if you have not done anything at all but you just happen to die there you will still be liberated why because that's the grace of shiva vishwanath shiva liberation is in the hands of god not really up to your uh, or our efforts so and that it's very strongly believed Uh, across uh, india across uh, uh, all sections of hindus so many actually go there to die when they actually go there to die they want to go stay there and uh, so that they pass away not so easy also because it requires the grace of god grace of uh, shiva if it's not there i know of a monk of our order um, someone i loved and revered as a little kid he actually went and settled down there for the last years of his life i am going to banaras i shall go and die there but he didn't die so he lived for 5 years 10 years 15 years and when he was pretty comfortable he thought there's a minor surgical uh, um, thing he had to get performed in lucknow mm. so he went there and this is perfectly all right he was not sick at all and he died there <laughs> <laughs> now how does one get liberated one might ask the question a non dualist will say unless you are enlightened you don't get liberated Now, Sri Ramakrishna had an extraordinary vision. Uh, he saw that in Manikarnika Ghat, when the um, bodies of the dead are being cremated, he saw in his vision he saw the Divine Mother, uh, Annapurna, who is Annapurna in Vishwa in Kashi. She is cutting he, in in his words, "Bhava Vandhan Chedan Kurchin." She is cutting the bonds, the bonds of the world, this worldliness. she is cutting it away that means ignorance she is cutting it away and he said he saw baba vishwanath that is shiva a vision that he, that near that departing soul shiva is coming and imparting tarak brahma mantra basically knowledge that you are brahman so knowledge is being given ignorance is destroyed past karma is destroyed by the grace of the divine mother and uh, the liberating knowledge is given by shiva and this is a mystical vision that Sri Ramakrishna had that makes the non-dualist very happy. Yes. So anyway, these are the background tensions and issues surrounding this chapter. Um, 
the devotee of course vaishnava vedanta they are all very happy good see you non dualists <laughs> and here krishna himself clearly has given support that the path of devotion is easy and fast and uh, much better uh, sri ramakrishna often would say that the path of knowledge is difficult kolite narodiya bhakti the, the bhakti as taught by narada narada bhakti sutras is there in kali yoga that is the best i mean the best in the sense it is most suited to most people all right this is all background now let us go into it first verse where arjuna will ask the question arjuna vacha arjuna vacha evam satata yuktaye evam satata yuktaye bhaktas tvam paryupasate bhaktas tvam paryupasate ye chapyaksharam abhyaktam ye chapyaksharam abhyaktam tesham ke yoga vittamah tesham ke yoga vittamah arjuna said between these devotees who worship you being thus ever devoted and those who worship the imperishable unmanifest who are better versed in yoga ke yoga vittama vit means to know tama means better yoga do who knows yoga better between whom between these two one is those who worship you love you who are devoted to you or those who worship in the sense their hearts are set on the imperishable unmanifest brahman in other words path of devotion path of knowledge if you want to put it that way which is better which is a better way so arjuna says we'll take a closer look at the verse evam in this way in which way in the way in the last six chapters from chapter 7 8 9 10 and 11 culminating in the amazing experience in 11 as you have taught me and in the culminating in the final verse of the 11th chapter uh, devotion in this way evam those who are constantly devoted to you this is the sign of real devotion satata yukta satata yukta means constantly and yukta is a very interesting word centered connected poised or as we would say you're tuned in or america will say you're clued in not even clued much more than clued in you're actually constantly centered poised connected yukta from that yoga also has come yukta satata continuously without a break so uh, those who are continuously connected see devoted to god believing in god a kind of intellectual assent to the existence of god many many people give in fact anybody who says that i belong to a religion especially a theistic religion a christian a muslim a jew a um, hindu we all say we believe in god so that's a intellectual assent i believe this to be true but satata yukta means something else constantly thinking about constantly loving constantly being immersed that's an entirely different ball game centered in one sadhu put it nicely who is a bhakta he said kabhi kabhar mandir to sab jate hain kabhi kabhar bhajan to sab karte hain once in a while you go to a temple or a church or a mosque everybody does that once in a while who doesn't do it once in a while you listen to a devotional song once in a while you pray to god everybody does it that does not make you a bhakta a devotee of god then who is a devotee of god the one who consistently seeks god practices that which will get one closer to god and consistently avoids the opposite at least makes an effort to avoid the opposite that which will take me away from god what will keep my mind on god my heart on god what will and carefully avoid that which will sweep me away from god that person is a devotee satata yukta constantly without any gap i am reminded of in a different context non dualistic this punjabi sadhu whom i used to study uh, ashtavakra gita from in gangotri so one day a word came in the ashtavakra gita nirantara nirantara antara means gap nirantara no gap you are constantly 
in the awareness of awareness. And he was telling us, gathered monks, that I was going to teach this verse today. From the morning, I'm thinking, how do I explain, illustrate this gapless awareness of awareness? And then he said, we're sitting on the bank of the Ganga in Gauri Kunda near that. So the Bhagirati, the river which has just melted from the glacier is flowing very fast there. He says, then I suddenly look at the answer is right there in front of me. Look at the flow of the Ganga. The constant roar of the water. The constant roar of the water. That is Nirantara. Without a gap, without a break. Meditate on that. Be aware of that. Then you think, what is it like to be aware of awareness? I had a very interesting personal experience that night. Uh, little hut, no electricity, no facilities, no bed, uh, nothing. Just you know, lie on the f- couple of blankets on the floor and couple of blankets above you. And uh, no work, light food, very nice place. So you don't get much sleep also. But there isn't anything else to do. In the dead of the night, you're br- absolutely awake. There's nothing else to do. So. So I'm not saying that I'm a, a very great meditator, just because there was nothing else to do. What else will you do? You sit and repeat the mantra. But that day, because of that Nirantara uh, t- teaching, I had this amazing experience. It didn't stop several hours deep into the night. I couldn't stop repeating the mantra. Whenever uh, I sort of seized or paused, not paused, the roar of the Ganga was in the background. And so continue like that, like that. You can't stop it. You get swept away with the mantra. Satata Yukta. Continuously centered in God. Continuously poised in God. How is it possible? See, we have all heard from our childhood. Think of God always. Or at least we have read. But really, how is it possible? The way we understand it, that way it's not possible. The way we it's normally understood is, you remember God. So if you are repeating a mantra, Om Namah Shivaya or Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, whatever the mantra is, you remember to repeat it. Or you recall God. So remembrance, repetition, recalling in Sanskrit Smriti, that you one cannot do it continuously. Nobody can. The mind is not designed that way. It will flicker. It's like saying that you keep your eyes on this object. Yes, you can. But the moment, then you can't use the eyes for anything else if you keep it there. And you can't. Basically, you look around somewhere sometime. Similarly, the mind is an even more subtle instrument. So the mind will flicker. Other thoughts and feelings will come in. Even for the person who is repeating the mantra continuously. Even for the Buddhist monk who is watching the breath continuously. It mind will flicker. Technically, it's impossible to keep remembering God all all day long and all uh, night long and throughout your days. Impossible. Then what does it mean? Satata Yukta, continuously connected to God. It means in this way. I'll give you a couple of three ways. One is through love. Suppose you love your child. If you're a parent, father or a mother, you love your child. Now, even when you are not thinking about the child, is it that you have stopped loving your child? No. The love of the child is constant, whether you are actually thinking about the child or not. No parent continuously thinks of the child. That would be craziness. But you continuously love your child. Let me illustrate this in another way. Mm, Somebody asked, that how do I keep my mind continuously on God? Because I have got work to do. So there is work, you, that requires the mind. The mind will be diverted. It's, uh, you're working on a computer or driving a car or something. So you have to pay attention to what you're doing. You can't pay attention to God. You can't keep your mind always on God. That's true. But you can't keep your mind always on God. But you can keep your heart always on God. By falling in love with God. So when we fall in love with God, our heart is given to God. And uh, that does not take any more effort because you are already you already love God. Just like you love your child, whether you are thinking about your child or you are paying attention to the child or not, but you do automatically. It's, it, that is constant love. So yukta, one way of being constantly connected to God is to love God. Bhakti. Satata yukta. That's one way. Your heart is given. Your mind may be used for different things. The mother 
who throughout the day, suppose there's a young baby in the house, throughout the day the mother does so many things, all for the baby. The mother is cooking and cleaning and you know, uh, all sorts of stuff mothers do. Now, all the time the mother may not be thinking directly about the child, but the heart is on the child. And that's why all of this is going on. That's why the child doesn't get an itemized bill afterwards. So much money for cooking, so much for cleaning, so much for <laughs> groceries. No. Because it's all done out of love. And the love is continuous, constant, even when you're not thinking about it. So exactly like that, uh, one may do all sorts of work in the world, but the heart is given to God. So that's one way of connecting. Continuous connection with God. Another way was suggested by um, Krishna, a, a second way. In the 10th and 11th chapters, 10th chapter especially, Vibhuti Yoga. So whatever we are experiencing, whatever normally takes your mind away from God, what takes your mind away from God? Vishaya, world. Things of the world, people of the world, activities of the world. That takes our mind away from God. Now, put God into those activities, into those people, into those objects. That's what Krishna did in the 11th chapter. In everywhere, in the Himalayas, know me, know me to be the Himalaya, or Mount Meru among the mountains, know me to be among the heavenly bodies, know me to be the sun and the moon, um, I am the fire that you offer to uh, among, so, uh, among human beings, I am such and such. All that is glorious and great, and in fact all that is not glorious and great, whatever you come across, whatever we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, is all pervaded by one divinity. Whomever we meet, known, unknown, friend, foe, whatever you think, they are all pervaded by that same divinity. Wherever we go, all pervaded by the same divinity. We are immersed in an ocean of God. So if you put God in the universe, if your understanding is that, in that case you will never go away from God because whatever we come across, we will keep connecting it to God. I have read reminiscences of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. In their conversations, there is a beautiful conversation, I think Swami Turiyanandaji and someone is Premanandaji or Shivanandaji, Premanandaji probably. That I recall that one time when we sat and talked and whatever we talked about, you connected it to Sri Ramakrishna. One of them is saying to the other one. So it, everything reminded you of Sri Ramakrishna. That's how the heart gets connected to God by everything in my life is connected to God. You bring it back to God. Sri Ramakrishna was himself like that. Anything and everything in the world would immediately send him into God consciousness, into an awareness of the presence of God. So that's one way. Put God in the Vishaya, put God in the world. That was the, the whole idea of the 10th chapter. To see the divinity in all beings. Uh, first in all the glorious things and then in all beings. That's another way of being connected. Continuously. Because everything in the world will remind you of God. And the third way, that's not a devotional way, it's a way of knowledge. Where you realize, I am that, Aham Brahmasmi, I am that. One thing you can never get away from is yourself. You are, wherever you are, there you are. Whenever you are there, then you are. You are always there. And that you is really God. But in what sense? So that has to be realized. That is the Advaitic realization. That's another way of effortlessly being, being ever in the presence of the divine. Because your own, that you re realize the divinity within yourself. So you are always there. The one thing that's always there is you yourself. So these are three ways. Someone will be thinking, which was the first one again? The problem is how, do I, how does one continuously think about God? One is, you, do, you don't, you can't. But one can be continuously in love with God. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, he says, what is spirituality after all? He says, it's falling in love with God. As you fall in love with a human being, you fall in love with God. So, that's one way of being continuously connected to God. Another way of being continuously connected to God is to throw God into this universe. Immanence of the divine. Whomever, wherever we are coming into contact with, the God is there. Vivekananda said, never approach anything except as God. What an extraordinary practice. And it's a practice which can be done all the time, anywhere. You can at least try it. The third way, I think the most deepest and most powerful way, is to um, 
रियलाइज आई एम दैट अहम ब्रह्मास्मी देन इट्स नेचुरल इट्स नेवर नेवर गोज अवे इट डज नॉट रिक्वायर एनी एफर्ट एनी मोर आफ्टर दैट एनी वे ऑल दिस इज अ रैंट अबाउट सतत युक्त हाउ वन कैन बी एवर कनेक्टेड टू गॉड भक्तास्वांग पर युपासते डेवोटीज ऑलवेज वर्शिप यू दिस यू अर्जुन इज आस्किंग दे वर्शिप यू दिस यू हैज मल्टीपल इंटरप्रिटेशन वॉट इज दिस यू मीन अकॉर्डिंग टू शंकराचार्य इट मीन्स दैट वॉट वॉज सेट इन द इलेवेंथ चैप्टर दैट विश्व रूप विराट द कॉस्मिक फॉर्म ऑफ गॉड ब्राह्मण इन दिस एंटायर यूनिवर्स दैट्स वॉट यू मीन्स यू वर्शिप यू हैज दिस गॉड एज दिस यूनिवर्स according to ramanuja acharya you means um, no, vishnu narayana god in vaikuntha uh, in, in god in heaven the poet says god's in his heaven and all's right with the world <laughs> so that god in heaven and christian says father in heaven so another meaning of you would be that god who is not this here in this universe but that god who exists in heaven vishnu narayana other vaishnava vedantins if you ask the uh, the hari krishnas here the iskon uh, the followers of achintya bheda bheda they will say no 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 you means the one who is speaking one Ar- to whom arjuna is speaking right now krishna the incarnation of god that blue 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 hued uh, with the peacock feather and a flute or the uh, reins of the chariot in his hand that divine person most visibly present see your god in heaven uh, is a concept and i'm sorry but it is something that you believe in it's not visible and this so called god is this entire universe that's grand but that's first of all it's scary and second arjuna was terrified second unless one really gets an insight it still seems rather abstract you still see the world as the world not as god really it still takes some effort but here is the beautiful krishna in front of you in front of arjuna there right now here this one so twam those who worship you paryupasate in all ways possible those who worship you and that there is this other group aksharam abhyaktam those who worship brahman the absolute which is the imperishable which is the unmanifest which you cannot see hear smell taste touch you can see hear smell taste touch this world you cannot do that to brahman you cannot conceive of brahman with a form you cannot conceive of brahman as god in heaven also that also there's a name and a form there's a kind of conception about him even if it is formless and god in heaven can be with form and formless with attributes omnipresent omniscient omnipotent but with no particular form all of those are um, you know conceptions um ab abhyaktam he says aksharam abhyaktam it is not an object of any of these conceptions the nirguna brahman those who want to realize i am that of these two ke yoga vittama who is a no better knower of yoga is phrased it this way krishna's answer is um unequivocal he says it's bhakti yoga <laughs> and to the disappointment of the non dualists he will qualify it later he will say those who um, worship those who follow the path of non dual knowledge they too will realize the same reality however their path is more difficult he will say that later next verse but i mean uh, third and fourth and fifth verses but first very important verse krishna's answer to this question shri bhagavan uvacha mai aveshya mano yevam mai aveshya mano yevam nitya yukta upasate nitya yukta upasate shraddhaya parayo peta श्रद्धया परयो पेता ते मे युक्त तमा मता ते मे युक्त तमा मता द ब्लेसड लॉर्ड सेड दोज हू वर्शिप मी फिक्सिंग देर माइंड ऑन मी एवर डिवोटेड एंड एंडाउड विथ सुप्रीम फेथ वेम आई रिगार्ड एज द बेस्ट योगिन्स 
he says that um, the devotees are the best knowers of yoga those who love god he uses the word me mataha this is my opinion this is my advice now see whenever krishna uses that word you should be alert who is saying this god the incarnation of god is saying it and throughout the gita he teaches what he teaches is vedanta what he teaches is bhakti what he teaches is yoga it's found in the upanishads long before krishna so he's teaching that he talks about sankhya he talks about yoga he talks about non dual realization all of that so many things he has talked about once in a while rare while he says me mata but this is my opinion there we must perk up our ears and uh, listen carefully here is god's in my humble opinion if you if you want you can take this this is good for you we would do well to re- <laughs> we would do well to listen very carefully sri <laughs> sri ramakrishna in the gospel of sri ramakrishna you will find in bengali he sometimes says ekhan karmat the view of this place this is non dualism this is dualism this is this this is that and all of them work he says but the view of this place is something he has a particular thing which he wants to push first of all it's always the harmony of religions the different paths lead to the same goal and then um the yogas all of the yogas through the way of knowledge meditation and the harmony of that having all of those yogas in your life having love in your life selfless activity in your life uh, knowledge in your life and meditation in your life sort of a broad big picture of spirituality is all inclusive so many of those things he would say the importance of actual realization as distinguished from mere intellectual assent to a body of doctrine as distinguished from reading books or as distinguished from rituals actual realization these are things he would emphasize the view this is some tv show called view <laughs> <laughs> the view yesterday and the swami and i we were walking past the christmas tree at rockefeller center and there is a, a nbc news and, and people are all they get little glimpses of their favorite newscaster i think so they are all waiting there outside in the cold to see through the so my my view krishna says is this what is his view first he says some very important and beautiful points maya avashya mano ye maam essence of bhakti avashya means to throw yourself in immerse yourself to be drowned in god as it were my in me to the exclusion of all else see anything great cannot be done without focus this is what anywhere in the world anybody who is in science in business in art in and especially in religion focus the ability to hold on to one thing and say no to everything else you know the sense of focus i remember one thing which we we studied as uh, students before i became a monk i still remember that decision how to make a decision so the professor wrote a and b on the blackboard and he said make make a decision choose one so i or somebody else i don't know somebody went up and ticked and with a chalk on the board say a and the professor said no you have to tick the a and cross out the b remember the word decision comes from scissor scissare like cesarean operation to cut to take a decision you have to select one that's true but you have to cut out deliberately consciously cut out every other possibility what they say burn the bridges there should be no retreat from what you have chosen it's because all the options are available i want to get up at 4 am or 5 am in the morning and practice yoga like the swami told me to i think that's a great idea and i say yes i will do it i've chosen to do it but then i fail why because when i get up at at 4 or 5 am option is there snooze button <laughs> and press the snooze button option is there you can get up at 5:30 6 6:30 7 7:30 mm. now until you cut out those options uh-huh. then the only option really remaining is 5 then you get up at 5 there's no other way um 
in the monastery the way we achieved it was with the help of uh, Sw- swami remembers with the help of the pestilential uh, bell which would ring at 3:40 a.m. and some eager beavers would be up before that and they would have already gone and meditating before but i would try to get every last minute of sleep until the bell rang and they would be very um, you know kind and they would come if you don't get up they'll kind of come and ring a little more near your <laughs> ears uh, it was a big bell but also peer pressure because you are with other monastic novices all of whom are getting up then you won't feel like lazing around in bed when all of your uh, other brother monks are going to meditate so that works um sri ramakrishna cutting out uh, very early in the morning and before well before sunrise holy mother would be there uh, lakshmi didi uh, lakshmi didi was a young girl at that time he had sri ramakrishna instructed everyone way long before sunrise to be up and meditating and uh, as he would pass by their room he would say are you still sleeping Is, have you come here to sleep and um, the holy mother would wish uh, sharada devi whisper whisper to uh, lakshmi didi that uh, don't listen to him he has no sleep at all <laughs> you should sleep a little more you're a young person you need your sleep sleep a little more but sri ramakrishna would do the second thing then that cutting off the scissor on the way back um when he came across the room again he would pour a bucket of ganga water under the door so that <laughs> the floor would get they would sleep on the floor on the mattresses there's no way of sleeping anymore <laughs> one story reminds me of another the hut where i lived in in gangotri a monk told me in the high himalayas monk told me that you know before you lived there there lived a nepali baba there a, a monk from nepal there and uh, one day they saw him that he had failed to get up early in the morning they saw him he had the same kind of blanket he had wrapped the blanket around him he went and jumped in the ganga which is shallow he wouldn't drown but he ice cold and he doused the ba- blanket in that ice cold water and he wrapped it around himself and he shouted to himself you like remain, remaining wrapped up in a comfy bl- blanket enjoy enjoy <laughs> telling his body this lesson that he will never forget and we also will not ever forget when we have heard it about it through somebody else second hand source so that is the cutting off never again mai aveshya immersed in me and me alone see think about it this way this struck me you know arjuna is asking a question where is he he is in the middle of a battlefield there are horses and elephants and warriors and archers and swordsmen and uh, the battle drums are being and the battle conch is being blown um, and in the midst of that he is asking krishna what is a better way devotion or the way of knowledge he's so into it yeah. this is the 12th chapter in contrast just think about i was just thinking about, about others our, our condition i'm thinking about my condition one mosquito is enough to disturb me from my meditation on the absolute <laughs> yes the swami knows in our main monastery we had to do a running battle the mosquitoes also were early risers they knew the monks would be meditating then and the monks are very vulnerable because they are not supposed to move around you can bite them and suck their blood so <laughs> you have to have a running battle with the mosquitoes one mosquito is enough to throw us off our meditation on the ultimate limitless brahman <laughs> little disturbance in our life a little illness a little mental upset somebody said something a little work pressure i have had too much work today or i am tired today i can't do my meditation it is enough to throw us away from sweep us away this is not what he says maya aveshya your mind is not immersed in spiritual life i remember once i was very sick in a hospital and uh, um i thought i was on this iv uh, i was very uh, young a young monk and i was very sick nearly died but i obviously made it through <laughs> but uh, but i thought all right so i'm very sick i don't have to do my daily meditation here nobody is going to and nobody did nobody is going to yell at me for not meditating in morning and evening you're sick after all you, you you get a break but my eyes were opened metaphorically 
I saw in front of me a, a very old monk was wheeled in after an operation. He was still uh, in um, anesthesia, under anesthesia. So they put him down on the bed and they wheeled the stretcher out. Then the monk woke up. He was woozy and all. Next morning, early in the morning, since I was lying down all day long, I didn't get sleep at night. So I would be awake most of the time. I saw in the dead of the night before sunrise, this monk who had just had an operation uh, last night and is elderly. He struggled up in his bed, turned around, faced in the hospital bed, faced the blank wall and sat like a rock for the next two hours in meditation. That showed me. So there are no holidays in spiritual life, no vacations, no break. Maya Avesha, immerse yourself. We are, we are studying the Mundaka Upanishad. I'll say this and stop. Um, if you remember, the, the metaphor of uh, archery was used. Those who have attended that class, the metaphor of archery. So the Vedanta, Upanishads, Gita, this is your bow. Brahman, the absolute, ultimate reality, or God, let's say, is the target. And the arrow, what's the arrow? It's you. The mind, basically the mind, the sentient being. It's the mind which is the arrow. And the mind has to be, it says, Nishita, sharpened, straightened and sharpened. Straightened through karma yoga, purify the mind, sharpened through regular meditation. And then, of course, it's a path of knowledge. And then through this path of knowledge, listening to the teachings, uh, getting clarity and meditating upon it, you shoot the arrow. And the arrow should become, it says, one with the target. Becoming one with the target, mind becoming one with the target means the realization that I am Brahman. But before that, it says, to shoot the arrow you must, yes, pull back the bowstring. You can't just release the arrow there, it will just fall in front of you. To give it, to propel it to the target, you must pull back the bowstring. Uh, by a mind immersed in bhava. Saturated by love, intensity, focus, pull back, turn inwards, turn away from the world, worldliness into the spiritual project. So this pulling back, why do some become monks? Why do people meditate shutting out the world? Why? This focus, this cutting out everything else and immersing, not just cutting out, then the mind will be a vacuum, not a vacuum, immersed in me. Mayavesha, Avesha, Avesha. In fact, another meaning in non Sanskrit, in other Indian languages, is Avesha means being possessed of a ghost, possessed by a ghost. Just a person becomes crazy possessed by a ghost. Similarly, don't be crazy, uh, but be crazy about God. Sri Ramakrishna, if you think about him, when he is seeking God, the vision of Kali, he says if he's possessed, literally like being possessed by a ghost, day and night. Vivekananda says, he struck me as being a monomaniac. God and God and God, only one thing. And Sri Ramakrishna, when this was put to him, he said, yes, he admitted it freely. Yes, I am mad. The world chooses to be mad ab about you know, lust and gold. I am mad about God. So, this is Maya Veshya. This is Bhava Gate Na Chaitasa. Ayamya means pull back the bowstring. The, the senses, turn them inwards. The mind, focus it on whether your path of knowledge or your devotion or your mantra, whatever it is, focus it there and hold it steady and let fly the arrow. There are more things which I would like to say about this verse before we proceed, but we have run out of time. So a couple of questions I saw raised hands. Yeah, at the right at the back. Yeah, boldly raise your hand. You're hesitantly <laughs> raising your hand. If you raise your hand, then they can see you and bring the microphone to you. Tell us your name and ask the question. Uh, Let fly the arrow. <laughs> in fact, in the Brihadarni Upanishad, there is questions are arrows. Um, the great woman philosopher, saint uh, uh -huh, Gargi, she questions the, the hero of Vedanta, Yagya Valkya, the greatest Vedanta in all of Vedantic literature. Uh, in the court, in the debate, the toughest opponent he had, the most closest questioner he had was this lady, Gargi. And the way she put it was, I have two, two questions, which are like sharp arrows, which I'm going to let fly at you. 
like arrows poison tipped arrows he says which is basically is going to devastate your whole structure which you have built up anyway please uh hi swami ji uh, i'm priya uh, is self realization <coughs> different from enlightenment all right the way we i'm using it no the word self realization is a english translation of um atma gyana atma vidya or atma gyana and enlightenment also i mean the same thing enlightened about what brahma gyana realization that i am brahman or i am the atman i am not the body not the mind i am this limitless consciousness that's what is meant by self realization if you had said if you had tweaked the question a little is self realization and god realization different that would be another interesting question in an advaitic sense no in fact self realization is god realization atman is brahman in the advaitic sense uh, but in a devotional sense in other philosophies self realization and god realization are different first self realization then god realization is higher and uh, final in a vishishta advaita or dvaita uh, sense all right please bring the microphone forward yes the gentleman here pranam swami ji so uh, tell us your name and ask the question amit. amit and so from the last week where we ended the previous chapter and also it's going to come up again can you uh, talk about ananya does it mean uh, when the when bhagwan says does he mean nobody other than me yes. krishna yes. or does it also or can it also be interpreted as uh worship me as none other than your own true self mm, both ways um ananya means none other th- that direct meaning is not other none other let there be nothing else in your heart like um you know worship of god or success or you know how many people like me or love me all of those things they constitute a second to god and that divides our attention and our love so the whole thing must be picked up carefully from the world and focused on god so ananya bhakti not scattered among many and that's why um you know in hinduism we have the idea of an ishta devata so god yes god is worshiped in all forms in all religions and an extraordinary variety of ways in hinduism but when you practice it you must have we must have one goal one form one name while knowing all of them to be true so the guru initiates us or our tradition initiates us into a particular way so that's also ananya bhakti but the um, second interpretation which you gave that is an advaitic interpretation non dualistic interpretation know me as the that devotion which reveals you and your beloved god to be one reality so yeah that's the second interpretation but that will be acceptable only to the non dualist yes uh, i'll come to you the gentleman uh good evening swami ji my name is madhav yes um last week you told the story of um of a boy uh, that went to belur mat in kolkata and he wanted to become a monk mm. and this is at the height of the freedom struggle yes um my question is how is becoming a monk and renouncing all worldly desires Uh, aligned with the four purusharthas it just seems as though renouncing all worldly desires would be the opposite of dharma artha kama and moksha it is so there are four goals of human life kama pleasure uh, artha success wealth dharma merit um, goodness morality dharma is a very very wide spectrum uh, connotation and moksha liberation enlightenment freedom liberation uh, from samsara now moksha is understood as actually the exclusion of all the others there are two ways of being religious in uh, the introduction to the bhagavad gita commentary shankaracharya says dvivido hi vedokto dharma pravritti lakshana nivritti lakshanascha the vedic religion has these two streams one is pravritti which are uh, Uh, swami vivekananda he gave beautifully a circling outwards and other one is nivritti nivritti means vivekananda said circling inwards uh, coming inwards turning inwards 
turning to the heart of things, either to yourself or to the heart of this universe that is God. Now, one is the Pravritti Lakshana Dharma is Dharma Artha Kama, is a pursuit of what we already want. People instinctively want pleasure. People instinctively want success and wealth. Nobody has to tell people that, uh, you know, have fun. You don't have to go around and teach it and drill it into people. No, you don't have to. Uh, and, you know, be wealthy. And uh, the reaction of most people is, if only, if I, <laughs> if I had more money. Everybody wants more money. So that's instinctive. Well, then what can religion do there? What's the role of religion? Religion doesn't have to teach you that. The understanding in the Vedas is, what does religion teach? The do's and don'ts in, in Sanskrit, vidhi nisheda. They have a but purpose. The things which are good for us ultimately, and which we won't do naturally, religion has to tell us to do that. That's the meaning of the vidhi, the do's in religion. All religions basically function on this, on this principle. And the don'ts, the negative, the prohibitions uh, in Sanskrit, nisheda, those things which we would instinctively do, but they are harmful for us, for ourselves, for society and all that, something has, something has to come forward and stop it. And that's uh, the don'ts in religion. So do's and don'ts are given by religion, so that our pursuit of wealth and pleasure in this world are sustainable, are um, uh, not harmful, and ultimately conducive to our spiritual evo uh, evolution. So that is the idea of the pravritti marga, the way of uh, engagement with the world. Samsara, yeah, the one will be a samsara, going through samsara, this world, and then heaven after that, and after coming back from heaven again, this world, until one evolves enough to see that this isn't working. Then what will work? Then religion comes, and you ask religion, do you have anything more? I don't want this anymore. And then religion says, yes, I was waiting for you to ask. Come to the back, do back <laughs> of the shop. I have got something more. This is called Vedanta. Paravidya, Paravidya. The transcendent knowledge and the relative knowledge. So far you have been in the realm of the relative knowledge. Conventional religion. Now come to higher religion. Come to spirituality. Come to the higher knowledge. Which tells you that by the realization of reality, call it God or your own self, by the realization of that, you will be free of samsara. Samsara, you cannot make it perfect. The finite can never become infinite. By the way the Upanishads put it is, through action in this world, you cannot reach uh, infinity. Everything through action is limited. Whatever effort we put in, good or bad, will give rise to results which are good or bad. And they will all be exhausted one day. Heaven and hell will all be exhausted one day. But the reality beyond this, beyond this cycle of cause and effect, beyond causality, is uh, Brahman, Moksha, Self-Realization. And that definitely is a rejection of the others, of Dharma Artha Kama. This is one point. So when you go, Moksha is the goal. Now questions arise, two questions arise. One question would be, if this is so, then why don't you stray it straight away? Why go through this Dharma Artha Kama and all of that? If that's going, not going to be the final solution, the, what that will help me, uh, help everybody else uh, solve my questions, give me peace, then why teach those things? It's because we want it, we won't listen otherwise. Uh, suppose if you say to everybody, forget your Ivy League education, forget your Wall Street, forget your Hollywood, <laughs> forget uh, uh, your family and everything and then you just sit and meditate and listen, come to the Vedanta class and then you become enlightened and that's it. We will say goodbye to Vedanta. Thank you very much. We are not interested. What we are interested in is this world. This is a wonderful world. And uh, 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 there are thousand and one things to be done. This is extraordinary. What you are talking about sounds theoretical and crazy. Why should I at all listen to all that? I am going to have fun in this world. I am going to do my best. Um, then does religion have anything to offer such a person or not? Thankfully religion has. Every religion has this conventional side, especially the, in the Vedic religion, this was very clear. Yes, the Vedic religion says, good luck to you, you have chosen the long, the scenic route, but there is something that will help you on the scenic route, that is dharma. You pursue your, go ahead and pursue pleasure, go ahead and have fun, go ahead and earn a million bucks, but 
within the limits of morality within the limits of ethics and with a goal to evolution to grow so all of this how to live a better life in this world pursuing worldly goals but how to evolve spiritually that is conventional religion and that's for the masses everybody can be helped by that but when you really have this deep question what's the point of it all then you come to the higher spirituality so that's question number 1 why not teach it straight away it has been done people have taught it straight away the buddha tried it give everything up come be a monk but it's not suited for everybody ultimately buddhism also had to develop a vast network of doctrine and teaching for the householder for everybody then the second question will be oh so to be spiritual then you have to give up all connections with the world dharma artha kama you don't need no that's also mistaken the same activities in the world can continue but the goal is no longer artha and kama pleasure and success in the world the goal is no longer going to heaven after death the same activity the same battlefield arjuna is in notice he didn't give up that pursuit the actual activities can continue but krishna is showing him how those very activities can become instead of being a bondage in samsara can become a spiritual practice which will liberate you all right so these are the two questions the last um I'll just take two questions here the gentleman you had your hand up yes yes you can give the microphone and then the lady in front yes and thank we'll you stop there so in the first chapter um basically arjuna doesn't want to kill his family yes and friends etc but uh, you are saying that in the 12th chapter we're saying don't hold anyone as your enemy yes so to kill or not to kill uh th- this is exactly the same question as that can you do your duty say as a soldier fighting a war without hating the enemy you can actually if you actually talk to soldiers are they filled with hatred against the enemy sometimes they might be often they are not often they are just doing a du- uh, doing a job so yes one can do one's du- uh, duty do it as a duty as a spiritual practice another way of doing it would be with with that person is my enemy i am this guy and that that guy is against me and i'm going to wipe that guy out that was arjuna's uh, initial approach to it which he gave it up he said I, i'm not going to go down that path then should i fight this war at all or not and arjuna's instinct was i don't want to fight this war and then krishna makes it even worse by teaching him vedanta you are not the body not the mind you are the atman arjuna thinks good great I want to realize this I want to attend Vedanta classes I want to meditate upon it I don't want to fight this stupid war then Krishna teaches him that the karma yoga very powerful method of spiritualizing our worldly life so the battlefield metaphor works in many many ways one is as a metaphor as a symbol but also as a reality it it's actually also meant to be that there's really a battlefield and really a person who wants to be spiritual but caught up in in a battlefield what does that person do and krishna's uh, teaching is very interesting you may not agree with it he says no you have to do your duty but you have to do it in such a way which will take you beyond uh, uh, worldliness all right the lady thank you thank you shami ji my question is how tell us your name first my name is kostubhi mm. how does one know if the person is doing a divine mother's will or just pursuing ego- egoistic gratification yes um we have to do our best see the, all these teachings are there one good check is what am i doing is it moral or immoral often Im- the immoral thing which we do you'll see it is always prompted by an egoistic will nobody goes out and kills and robs as i'm doing good to you it's out of entirely out of the goodness of my heart that i'm stealing <laughs> no there is some personal angle involved in immorality so morality is a good check another checks vivekananda pointed or some checks for example does it strengthen you or does it weaken you this strength Uh, whatever strengthens you accept it whatever weakens you reject it as poison weakens means physically morally emotionally spiritually another test vivekananda suggested was selflessness is if it is selfish then it's likely to be wrong if it is selfless it's likely to be right these are tests you have to apply another one is that which unites is likely to be right that which divides is likely to be wrong 
likely to be false. These are tests of truth. Then you have to decide for yourself. The problem often is not whether it's right or wrong. Sometimes it is, but often it's not. The problem often is I know what's right, but I just don't want to do it. I know what's wrong, I just can't help it. I am, I'm doing it. That book is there, very famous book. It, I mean, everybody in our days in college read it. Zen of Motorcycle man Maintenance. <laughs> Zen, no, the Art of Art of Motorcycle man Maintenance. And it starts with a quote from, uh, the, from, from Plato. I think it's from Phaedrus or something. It says, do I, just one question. Do I really have to tell you what is right and what is wrong? All right, on that question. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastum